Hands up, who here is the owner of an iPhone 6 or an iPhone 7? Okay. Hands up, who here would like $5 trillion? <laughs> there we go. What if I were to tell you that the iPhone 6 or 7 in your hand, in your pocket, or in your handbag contains a computer? And that in 1984, that computer would have been worth $5 trillion. Isn't it crazy to think that in 33 years, the computer in the iPhone 6 has gone from being worth $5 trillion to $649? We are living on the cusp of exponential growth in computing and the internet. If you think back to 50 years ago, the world was a very different place. But it was in the 1960s that Gordon Moore, Intel's co-founder, began to notice that the performance of computer chips was doubling on average every 18 months. So every 18 months, a computer chip was twice as smart as it was in the 18 months beforehand. This became known as Moore's Law, and today it's still very much in place, However, after many years of our computer chips doubling in speed and efficiency, we're really now beginning to see the impact of this. And it's going to change our lives. Did you know, for example, that today for $1,000, you can buy the computing power of a mouse brain? So that's the number of instructions per second that a mouse brain can process. Famed futurist Ray Kurzweil forecasts that by 2023, you'll be able to buy, for $1,000, the computing power of a human brain. And that by 2049, for $1,000, you'll be able to buy the computing power of all of the human brains on the planet combined. Whoa. Right? I'm 28 years old. And I can't remember a time when I wasn't able to access the internet via some kind of connected device. But it's in the last five years that my consumption has really shifted up a gear. To show you what I mean, I'm about to take you through a very scientific, very historical case study called the history of connectivity in the context of Mel's life. Let me take you back to 1994. The first Lion King movie had just come out, the PlayStation had just been invented, and we met Ross and Rachel in the first ever episode of Friends. I'm five years old, and Dad is following me around the house with a video camera, whilst I try to shove my baby brother into my brand new school bag. Mum has just announced that she's bought something called a car phone, and meanwhile, somewhere in Switzerland, a smart wee chap of the same age and with the same last name as my father, is inventing the World Wide Web. Flash forward to 1999, Bill Clinton is the US president and everybody is prepping for the millennium. By now, I'm eight years old and I am stoked on life <laughs> because mum's ditched the car phone, she's bought a computer, and we have dial-up internet. <laughs> yeah. You! Every Saturday morning for two hours, I'm allowed to take over the phone line, I'm allowed to launch Netscape Navigator, and I'm allowed to play Neopets. For those of you who have never experienced the glory of Neopets, it is a virtual world that still exists that allows you to create shops to earn Neocoins and then use your Neocoins to buy virtual critters called Neopets. But, with great earning comes great responsibility, and it's then your job to keep your Neopets alive by using your Neocoins to feed, bathe, shelter, and protect them. A job that must be done regularly, at least more than once on a Saturday morning. It was a brutal reality waiting the 10 minutes for the dial-up to connect, only to find out that last week's Neopets were long dead. A product of starvation and exposure. But Dad needed the phone line for work after school, so what was I to do? After many weeks of relentlessly killing off my Neopets, I got bored and decided to explore the website a little further. 
This is where I stumbled across something called the Neopets message forums. And that was the moment that I realized that there were real live people on the other end of the computer and that I could talk to them. The age of the Neopet lasted for two years until mum realized I was just chatting to strangers on the internet and I got grounded. <laughs> that was where my Neopets adventure ended. In 2001, the very same year that the world was introduced to Shrek and Donkey and the first Harry Potter movie was released, I started Intermediate. I was 12 years old, a teenager. And with that came a whole new world of virtual experiences, including MSN Messenger. My best friend bestowed me with my very first Hotmail email address, missfunkychick89 at hotmail.com. <laughs> and I launched headfirst into group chats with my school friends. I would come home from school every day, sneak into dad's office, fire up the modem and spend the afternoon sending gifts to cute boys from other classrooms until dad would come roaring in because he needed the phone and I'd be sent off to complete my homework. I was way too cool for Neopets. I'd learned that chat rooms were creepy and also I had other priorities, like a cute boy called Ryan from room 14, AKA hotboyry at hotmail.com. <laughs> Eventually, we got a second phone line and I got my first boyfriend. <laughs> I spent most of 2003 writing a list of reasons for my mum as to why I totally needed a mobile phone. Because mum, everyone else has got one. Because what if I get lost walking home from school? Because Steph's parents let her have one. What if I promise to plug it in every night before I go to sleep in the kitchen? Please. And on my 14th birthday, I became the proud owner of my very first Nokia 2280 mobile phone. The kind of mobile phone that you could throw off a building and it would survive. <laughs> this was also around the same time that MySpace became popular. So, of course, I had to save up for an iPod Classic so I could listen to all the cool punk rock music and also for a digital camera so that I could take photos at all the cool punk rock gigs and upload them to my MySpace profile. This was my very first public social media profile. I was, of course, connected with all my friends, a couple of people I didn't know, and another guy called Tom, who I'm fairly certain was a prerequisite. In 2005, the very same year that we began to understand that Shrek and Donkey were a thing of the past, the Harry Potter had or movie had already been released, and by now we were trying to cope with the breakup of Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. Lost had premiered on TV, and YouTube was born. By this time I was 15, and I could text with my eyes closed. I'd traded in my Nokia 2280 for a flip phone with a camera, but the camera was blurry and ineffective, so for five years I carried around my iPod Classic, my digital camera, and my mobile phone as separate entities. In 2007, at 17, I joined Facebook, and I opened the very same Facebook account that I have today. For 11 years, I've had my Facebook account. Over a decade. And people say that social media is a phase. Somehow, I survived high school, and I took off to university. I'd upgraded to a hot pink Motorola razor with color screen and roaming. I didn't really know what roaming was. All I knew was that it allowed me to access mobile internet. But every time I did, I used a whole $10 boost prepaid mobile voucher. So I didn't do it very often. So I took off to university with my technology collection in tow, consisting of my hot pink Motorola razor for texting, my iPod Classic, for listening to music, my digital camera for taking photos at all the cool uni parties, something called a scientific calculator. Wasn't really sure how to use that. Did know that if you turn it upside down, you can write boobies on the screen. <laughs> and I also had a white Apple Mac laptop, a present from my parents and my very first laptop computer. It was at this point that my consumption shifted up a gear. And I got my first iPhone over the next three years, so I ditched the iPod Classic and I ditched the digital camera. But I also learned to use 3G, so I could check my Facebook on the go. In 2014, when I was 24 years old, I started my digital marketing agency, 
So I learned to start and end my day with my emails. I also bought a Fitbit to remind myself to actually move every couple of hours. And I bought an iPad for the times when I just needed my laptop to be a little bit smaller or for my iPhone to be a little bit bigger, you know? In 2016, I was on my fourth iPhone in four years. I was also spending my evenings catching monsters in my bedroom using Pokemon Go. Now, in 2017, I travel to Wellington every second Tuesday to catch up with a couple of clients, and I've got to say that I get a bit sweaty and anxious at the thought of my phone being on airplane mode for the whole one-hour flight each way. You know, what if somebody needs to call me and they can't get through? What if somebody does a great Instagram post and I just really need to see it? God, what if I get bored? It would seem that I have a short attention span, you see. But is that a bad thing when I live in a generation whereby speed is the new success factor? In 2017, the life cycle of a product is six minutes. Six minutes. What excites me the most about this is that the greatest inventions of the next 30 years haven't even been invented yet. Isn't that cool? Let me show you what I mean. So right now, the web as we know it is built on a series of hyperlinks, right? A hyperlink is the thing that you click on that takes you through to the next web page. Basically, the web is anything that you can Google. But Google is not just a search engine. In fact, Google has absolutely zero interest in continuing to provide web search for free. It's not gonna get them very far. What Google is actually doing is building a database of artificial intelligence, and search is how we are teaching it. So, every time you conduct a Google search, every time you check on a result, every time you create a link, you're contributing to the Google database of artificial intelligence. Let's just call it the Google AI. So when you search for an image of Donald Trump, you're te teaching the Google AI what Donald Trump looks like. Now, times that by the three billion search queries that Google receives every single day. Whoa. So imagine then what will begin to happen when we start to see this kind of artificial intelligence combined with the objects that we use every day. We're going to see tiny little computer chips installed in devices that we're using, collecting information and feeding it back to this database of intelligence. We're already beginning to see this type of smart technology in products like the Amazon Alexa. The Amazon Alexa, for those of you who haven't heard of it, is a smart speaker that allows you to send emails, do your grocery shopping, control devices in your home, and make phone calls all without touching a button. The Amazon Alexa isn't available yet in New Zealand, but Amazon Prime is coming to Australia next year, so it's fair to assume that within the next two to three years we'll have access to this kind of technology. But if you can't wait that long, you will be thrilled to know that at Harvey Norman you can buy a smart bed. A smart bed is a bed that monitors your temperature, it monitors your sleep cycles, and it adjusts itself to make sure that you are getting the best night's sleep. Soon, this bed will be able to change its sheets, make itself, <laughs> and sing you a lullaby, if that's what you're into. Last month, Apple announced the launch of the Apple iPhone X, the first iPhone that has augmented reality as a standard operating feature. But Apple also announced something called Face ID. Face ID is a smart technology that works by projecting 30,000 invisible dots across your face using the camera to create a precise map of your facial features. This map can then be used as security against your iPhone. So let's say you go to the grocery store, you pay for your groceries using Apple Pay, so you wave your phone over the F-Plus machine, then instead of entering a PIN number, you can just look into your iPhone camera so your iPhone knows that it's you and will release the funds. But, wait for it, this type of technology is also enabled by machine learning. 
so it adapts as you age. This is in the latest iPhone release. This is happening now. Famed futurist Kevin Kelly forecasts that in the next five years, every surface will become a screen. So I'll be driving to work in my self-driving car, and I'll be able to screen the newspaper on the dashboard. I'll also be able to screen a movie on the ceiling, if that's what I want to do. But I'll also continue to have a tiny little evolved screen on my wrist, on which I can make phone calls and I can check emails. And that will be tracking my every move to make sure that all of my screen time is personalized. When I'm at the gym, my clothes will be made of smart technology. So they'll be tracking data about how my muscles are activating and feeding that data back to my virtual trainer. And I'm not just talking about a Fitbit. I'm talking about a whole workout T-shirt that has, is made of smart technology. Literally a workout T-shirt with a mind of its own. I feel so unbelievably sorry for that thing. <laughs> Developments in universal healthcare and sorry, and AI will mean that universal healthcare is far more easily accessible. As accessible as the GPS or the camera on your smartphone, and free. And we're already beginning to see advances in technology and robotics, meaning that tasks like surgery, they can now be performed with complete precision. Eventually, Inventions like Elon Musk's Neuralink will mean that my husband and I are able to have a conversation without saying a word out loud. <laughs> He'll be able to FaceTime me through a tiny computer chip installed in his brain, and I'll be able to see the world from his point of view. I'll be able to drive home from work, pull up to my house, open the door of my car with my mind, walk up to the front door. I'll be able to open the front door with my mind too. Every door in my house will be fitted with motor cortex sensors so that they can receive any thoughts that I transmit from my brain. I'll walk into the kitchen and I'll sit down at the table. I'll think about having a wine and my fridge will pour me a Pinot Gris. God, I can't wait for that day. Now, I know what you're thinking. Good God, this sounds absolutely terrifying. The robots are going to take over the world. Mel, I don't want my husband to be able to read my thoughts. <laughs> and fair enough. But rest assured, we've been through this kind of exponential growth before. We've seen it in the music industry. In 1877, the first microphone was invented. But it took a further 58 years before we were able to invent the cassette tape. Then it was another 47 before we invented the CD. But then it only took us 22 years to go from the first digital sound recording through to everybody having access to the entire world's music catalogue on their phones. So there's no need to panic. You won't wake up tomorrow and be able to drive your car with your mind, I'm afraid. But I do think that it is really important that we have an understanding of how exponential growth in computing and the internet is changing our world. And in my mind, it's for the better. I'm excited to be the girl that gets to go from trying to keep her Neopets alive on a Saturday morning, through to catching Pokemon in her bedroom, through to paying for her groceries with her face, and pouring wine with her mind. Thank you.